And really, it's lovely to have you with us, sincerely. So let me officially welcome you to the 9-11 Tribute Center presentation of We Were There. My name is Judith Pucci. I am a Tribute Center walking tour guide. As you just heard Lee explain to you in the film, all of us at Tribute, oh, I know that feeling. <laughs> all of us at Tribute have been, have had our lives directly and personally affected by the events of that day. The one thing I can tell you that Lee didn't mention is that we are an extremely diverse group. We are of different ages, we come from different backgrounds. There's such variety that in the normal course of life, many of us would never have met. And now we share a powerful bond. And Tribute is our home base. It's the reason we know one another, it's where we tell off stories, and it's where we find support. So this afternoon, you're going to be hearing two of these stories. They're going to be told to you by the people who lived the events they will be telling you about. And they're my fellow Tribute Center guides. So let me introduce you to, next to me is Matt Crawford, and next to Matt is Mary Lee Hannell. Mary Lee has worked for the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey for over 20 years, and I'll explain the Port Authority to you in a moment. She is currently the Chief Human Resources Officer. I think my mic just went out. Did it? Can you still hear me? Very good. Uh, so she is the Chief Human Resources Officer and the Port Authority. The Port Authority is the organization that developed and oversaw the building of the first World Trade Center and now the new World Trade Center. This is the organization that also oversees the management of our three major airports in New York City and a good number of our um, tunnels and bridges, correct? Good. Now, the Port Authority had its offices in the North Tower. The North Tower was the one that was attacked first. Mary Lee was at her desk on the 67th floor of the North Tower. As for Matt, Matt is a construction worker and he is currently working on the transportation hub which is the building right that way. It's the one that looks sort of like this, only better, I hope, you know, with the little spikes coming out of it. So you can thank Matt for all of that work. He is personally responsible for it all. <laughs> um, September 11th for Matt was actually a very defining moment in his life, and you'll be hearing why. But we're going to begin with Mary Lee's story. So let me give you a brief introduction. 8.46 a.m., September 11, 13 years ago. That is the exact time at which the first plane struck the North Tower, the building that Mary Lee was in. About 1,300 people were above the point of impact. All of them, every single one of them dies. Access to the elevators and staircases has been destroyed by the plane. Mary Lee's office was about 15 floors below the impact zone. So while she is still in a very dangerous place in the building, she at least has the chance of getting out alive. And it's all yours. what saved my life. Because when I walked into my office that morning, the minute I walked into my office, I felt what we then came to find out was a plane hit the building. If you've ever worked in the World Trade Center, you know that any tower that big has a soft sway to it. On a really stormy day, the door to my office would move back and forth slowly. Mm -hmm. That was not this kind of sway. What this was was a jerk to one side and then a snap back very quickly. All the ceiling tiles started to fall down. You started to see things slide off your desk. You were almost thrown to your feet by the power of it. And then you started to see things falling off the side of the building. Um, having been there also in 1993 in the bombing, it did not take me long to figure out that we needed to get out of the building. 
There were no announcements, no strobe lights, no emergency announcements of any kind to tell you that. You just knew. Um, as I walked by the elevators, I saw that the elevator doors had been blown, off and blown open and there was smoke. Uh, and so I told everyone and as we assembled to a central point that we needed to leave and we needed to leave quickly. And as we opened the door to the stairway, there were a sea of people in front of me, as far down as I could see and as far up as I could see, just people packed on the stairway. The great thing was that none of us knew we were in trouble. We all thought perhaps a commuter plane had hit the building. We thought that there was a tragic accident because there were no clouds in the sky that day. The sky was this color blue, and it was absolutely pristine, so it had to be an accident. So going down the stairs, which took about an hour to get to the bottom, was actually almost blissful because we didn't know what was going on. Sometime during that time, the second tower was hit. You could not feel it. You did not know what was happening. Your cell phones didn't work. Your pagers didn't work. There was no communication with the outside world. About the 28th floor was when I saw the best sight I could possibly see, and that was a New York City fireman, because I knew if he could get up, I could get out. And that was the first time I thought I was going to be OK. Um, when you got to the plaza area, which usually was reserved for, it was a fountain with some beautiful flower plantings and some benches. You would have uh, lunch there. You would listen to music. Um, that's when I knew I was in trouble. The plaza was littered with the wreckage of planes. It was, uh, there were fires. Uh, there were human remains scattered everywhere. Uh, and as you tried to go out that door, people were stopping you and telling you you needed to go under the building into the lobby area because there were people jumping into the plaza as you were standing there. Um, you have to wonder what kind of a decision they were faced with making when that was a good decision. I came out by the Millennium Hotel, um, thought about having a drink, but passed. Um, kept walking and was about two blocks away from the building when I started to feel a rumble under my feet. Uh, I turned around and I started to see the towers collapse and a huge gray cloud coming at me. And I remember thinking, I can't believe I made it out of the building and now it's going to fall on me. Mm. Uh, we tried to run into buildings, but the doors were locked. We couldn't get in. And so we did the next best thing. We held hands, we turned our backs, and we closed our eyes and we waited. Uh, we were completely engulfed in the cloud. Um, it took about 20 minutes, I think, for us to be able to actually see clearly enough. It went completely dark that day at that time. Your body does funny things to try and cope with what's going on. So at that time, as everyone around me says that they heard people screaming and running, I didn't hear or see any of that. I could have been standing at midnight in the middle of a snowstorm. I heard absolute silence, absolutely nothing. I made my way uh, home that evening. I got home at 8 o'clock that night. Uh, my husband got home just an hour before me. Uh, my family was there, my dad, uh, my brother, my sister-in-law, and my three children. My three children were 9, 7, and 5. They were thankfully all in the same school. Um, the next day I woke up, and I woke up to a bed that was covered with little kid bodies, all piled up on top of, of me and my husband. Um, somewhere during the night, we had, uh, they had all crawled down, and they um, had all crawled into bed. We had everybody except the dog with us. Um, and that's only because there wasn't enough room. Um, I will tell you that for the three kids, um, you know, getting out of the building I thought would be the hard part. That was the easy part. The three kids and what they went through was a harder thing to deal with for me. My nine-year-old heard in the cafeteria that the Twin Towers collapsed, so he turned to his friend Eric, who was also nine, and said, I think both my parents are dead. Mm -hmm. And then he waited all afternoon for someone to pick him up. Mm -hmm. And when it was my brother and my father, then he said he knew we were dead. My daughter was seven years old, and she said nothing for two and a half months. And at the end of that period, she said, I have a couple of questions. Do we have time? And we said, sure. And for two hours, she asked questions and ask some really tough ones. Some of the easy ones were, can you show me pictures of the hijackers? Can you tell me if you lost good friends? Some of the harder ones were, why would someone jump out of a building if they knew they were going to die? What happens to us if you and daddy die? Who do we go with? Who do we live with? Will we be separated? Will we be together? Will we be on the East Coast or the West Coast? All really tough questions. And my five-year-old would spend a Saturday afternoon or Sunday afternoon brunch 
and he would take fruit and he would build two replicas of the Trade Center and then he'd take a blueberry airplane and he'd knock them down and ask me if that's what happened. I lost 84 colleagues that day, seven really good friends. Right? Um, what I, I work with Tribute because this is a way to honor the people I lost. Um, in November, I will return to Four World Trade Center, which you can see right over here with all of our Port Authority colleagues. My kids are not happy about that. Um, I'm on the 23rd floor, which arguably I might be able to get a long enough rope to be able to get out if I need to. Um, but nonetheless, it represents a challenge. Um, I've been fortunate enough with World Trade Center Tribute to participate in a program for school children um, that helps teachers instruct about 9-11 uh, because it's not just us who remember where we were, it's our children as well, and our children's children who need to remember what happened that day. Thank you. People from the Port Authority were missing immediately afterwards, yes? Yes, yeah. Um, we actually, one of the first things I had to do uh, in being in the Human Resources Department was locate all of our employees, or try to call homes, um, call their families, try and figure out where people were. Um, some people couldn't make it home, and so they went to a friend's apartment. It took a couple of days, and mm -hmm. every time we found someone uh, who was alive, we cheered. But what Mary Lee also arranged for is that all of the Port Authority employees who were missing, she made sure that their families continued to receive their salary checks. She also established a day of remembrance and renewal for the Port Authority so that once a year they could do charitable works, good works, in we have, honor we have a of day the of service. Right. Yep, we have a day of service honor around 9-11. It's a way for those of us who went through it to, to uh, work with those people who are new to the Port Authority, who some mm -hmm. of whom don't know anything or remember anything about 9-11, to come together and honor those 84 people. Right. Well, as Mary Lee was evacuating the building, people like Matthew's father were racing directly into it. Matt's father was a New York City firefighter. So for me, growing up, in my mind, I lived with a Superman. In my case, Superman was about 5'9", had piercing blue eyes, a mustache, and a pot belly. And that Superman was my father, firefighter Robert J. Crawford. He was a firefighter for 32 and a half years on September 11th, and he was murdered in the South Tower. Um, having a father who was a firefighter, you get to be part of a world that a lot of people don't experience. Uh, for a young boy, one of the best worlds you could experience. Uh, one of my fondest memories, I was seven years old. I'm the youngest of five. My dad came, I think it was a Tuesday night on a school night, no less. At about 11 o'clock with the fire truck, woke us all up in PJs, put us all in the fire truck, turned the lights and sirens on, drove around the neighborhood, woke up all the neighbors. They weren't too fond of that, but you can only imagine seven years old, that was one of the greatest experiences of my life. Uh, bring your parent to school day, fourth grade, Mrs. Wallach, tyrant that she was, that's why I still call her Mrs. Wallach. <laughs> Told my father, sure you could come by, just do me a favor, don't bring any of the dangerous stuff like the axes, the pikes, the pole arms. He said, sure, no problem, Roberta. He said that because she didn't like it when he called her by the first name. Uh, the next day, what did he do? He brought the axe, the pike, the pole arms, all of that stuff. So now I have all my fourth grade friends using an axe to chop a desk, poking each other with the pole arms, walking around in the boots, tripping over themselves. She's having a stroke, but all, all your buddies now want to be your best friend because your dad's a hero, right? Uh, firefighters do two things really well. They save people and they cook. As a youngster, I was really good at two things myself, getting hurt and eating. So uh, it was always a nice thing to go to the firehouse with my dad. Uh, so now fast forward to September 11th. At this point in my life, I have a brother who's a cop, a sister who's a cop, and my father. Uh, I was out of town at the time, no cell phones worked. Bridges and tunnels were all closed. I see this happening on TV. I know my father's working. I don't know about my brother or my sister. Couldn't get in touch with anybody. It was a very difficult day. About 2 o'clock in the morning, my brother finally got through to me. I was very happy to hear his voice. He said, I'm fine. Rachel's okay, but we can't find Dad. I said, well, Dad's a firefighter. He's not going to stop and make a phone call. He's busy saving people. 
So no, you don't understand. I'm here now. I'm at the site. I'm with what's left of the people he worked with. They don't know where he is. They can't find him. You have to get here as soon as you can. Next two days are very hazy. I don't remember much. I'm Irish and Italian. I remember a lot of food and a lot of booze. Uh, September 13th, there will be a phone call that would kind of snap me out of that haze. My mother answered the phone, and she just said, he's alive, and she dropped to her knees and made a sound that I will never forget. Everybody started cheering. I said, how do you know? And she said, oh, Aunt Joan told me. I said, well, how would Aunt Joan know before the fire department? Until we bring him home, let's not get our hopes up. My brother and I came to the site, and when we got here, they had little ad hoc command posts set up all over the site. And we just went from one command post to the other, looking for my father. Bobby Crawford, 11904, Safety Battalion. Have you heard anything? Have you seen anything? I'd say, no, but check this command post, and we'd run to the next one. And as time went by, I got actually more and more angry. I, fu- I found myself getting angry with the firefighters because I knew this is what they did. They saved people's lives for a living. And I fully expected them to say, yeah, we got your dad right here, along with everybody else. And when that didn't happen, I started to get frustrated because I thought I'd be bringing my dad home. And it took quite some time later in the day, I finally we realized we were here for a long time. We hadn't stopped. We hadn't drank anything. We sat across the street. And that was the first moment that I actually looked at where we were and what happened here. And it was at that moment that I saw this look on these first responders' faces that really scared me. It was the look that I had on my face, same as my brother, sheer confusion, sheer terror. And every single first responder had that same exact look. And at that moment, just like that, I knew nobody was coming out of this place alive. And one of those people was my father. How do you go home to your sisters and your mother empty-handed without your dad? Definitely the hardest moment of my life. And at that moment, I realized, I said, you know what, if this is what we're capable of, I don't want to be a part of this human race anymore. How could you want to do something like this to so many people. My father represented the very best humanity had to offer. I'm not saying that because he's my father, I'm just saying that because that's how it was. My mother used to say my father could work for the CIA. He would never tell you what he was doing. And we found out because my father had a saying, he used to say, if you did a good deed and you got credit for it, then it didn't count. At my father's memorial, we saw three homeless people in the back of the church. And I went over to him, I said, you know Bobby? I said, yeah. He said, you mind me asking how? He said, oh, he used to always bring us food all the time. Never told anybody. That's how he lived his life. So that was one of the people that was murdered here that day. As I was having that thought, some lady who lived in the neighborhood rides by on a bike with a basket in the front. She didn't know what she could do. She decided that she was going to make sandwiches and get bottles of water and put them in that basket and hand them out to whoever wanted them. This may sound crazy, but believe it or not, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich saved my life. Because as bad as we can be, we are that much better. And if you take away anything from what I say today, remember that. Never give up hope. My father was taken from me, but I carry him with me every day, and now so do you. Thank you. Matt's father was one of 343 New York City firefighters who were killed that morning. Never before in the history of this city had the fire department lost so many of its firefighters in one morning. And the fire department was not alone. 23 New York City police officers dead. 37 Port Authority police dead. September 11 stands as the worst loss of first responders in a single event in United States history. I want to thank you two. Really, you were lovely. I thank you so much for uh, taking part in this. And what I'd like to do now is to open this up to all of you. If you have any questions for either Mike or Mary Lee, this is the moment. Just take a moment, no rush. People get shy, I understand. Please. Uh, no, and actually we were one of the lucky ones. Um, my father always liked to interrupt. He found one more way to do that. Uh, Thanksgiving night, as we sat down to have Thanksgiving dinner, there was a knock on my door. My whole family was over my house. 
uh, firefighter and chaplain came by. They found my father with six civilians. So uh, the old man was doing his job to the very end. Mm. <laughs> Anyone else? Ah, please. Uh, she has- Uh, I do the tours themselves. This year we do about uh, one every other month or so, and I do the tours at the Tribute Center, which is on the Memorial Plaza, about six to seven times a month. Um, I started with World Trade Center Tribute when it first started, so there was no building, and we used to stand in the street and just hawk people. Like, you want to hear something? Come on, it's free. Um, Because people would gather around the site and not know what they were looking at, and people would show horrific pictures, and there was no story and no understanding. So I actually answered an ad in the New York Times for uh, docents. So I was one of the charter docents that started about six years ago. I used to do it a lot, um, and then I found it became very difficult. And now that I know I'm going back to Four World Trade Center, I've um, re-upped my uh, volunteering with World Trade Center Tribute because I want this to be a comfortable place again. How many tours that we do at Tribute a week, each docent, they give us a great deal of latitude so people can uh, accommodate their schedules as well as just the emotional toll it takes on them. So like Matt, I usually do two tours a week, so about eight a month. One more, please. Yes. So, I might have did your husband also work in the World Trade Center? So, my husband was on the 72nd floor of One World Trade Center, uh, and we both made it out of that building today. So, we are about as lucky a story as you can possibly find because the consequences could have been, you know, really devastating with both parents. When did you know that he was safe? Um, I did not know that he was safe until 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, He knew that I was okay at about 1 o'clock in the afternoon. There was one woman on earth who knew we were both alive, and that was the secretary at the uh, middle school where my children were attending. We both managed to get to landlines, and we both called in. And so this one lone person uh, knew that both of us had made it out of the building. I think someone in the back had a question. We'll take that as our last one, please. What was the very, you said, for security reasons, they... You mean in terms of communication? Oh, I see. I see. I think it's my understanding on that day that there was such a flood, an overload of calls that came in, uh, that they actually couldn't get through it. I have a good friend in Florida who tried to call me, and she said the eerie part was that she got through and it started to ring, and then it was just open air stopped ringing, there was just open air. And then, of course, after the towers collapsed, all the communications were on the antenna of One World Trade Center, and so there was really uh, very little communication that you could get. You really had to get to a landline. Yeah. Um, I had a man ask for a telephone and that day. I'm a resident of Lower Manhattan, and his cell phone was useless, and the only reason he could use my phone is that it was a landline. And I'd say that it took about, maybe there's a 40% chance of getting through that day on a landline. You're very welcome. Why do we tell our stories is a question you might be wondering to yourselves. It's certainly one we're asked often on tours. There really is no single answer. Everyone at Tribute has his or her own reason for doing this. But what I can tell you is that we share a common hope, and that is that as horrific as that day was, that by telling our stories, we can show that September 11th was about more than loss, that it was also about our resilience. 